You're listening to the Talking Headways Podcast Network. This is Talking Headways, a weekly podcast about sustainable transportation and urban design. I'm Jeff Wood. This week, we're joined by Nelda Ruiz, President and Chief Executive Officer, and Rose Gray, Senior Vice President, Community and Economic Development at APM. Nilda and Rose discuss their ongoing community work and their TOD project in North Philadelphia. Stay with us. This episode was produced in partnership with Railvolution. To find out more about the Railvolution conference, including this year's virtual conference or next year's in-person conference in Phoenix, Arizona, go to railvolution.org. That's railvolution.org. Today's podcast is brought to you by our super generous Patreon supporters. Thank you infinitely for supporting the show. You can support the show by going to patreon.com slash the overhead wire. Today's podcast is also brought to you by the numerous projects of the overhead wire our 14-year-old daily newsletter where you can sign up for a two-week free trial by going to theoverheadwire.com, and our audiobook production of Raymond Unwin's 1909 classic, Town Planning in Practice. Pick it up and listen to it as a podcast by going to theoverheadwire.com or raymondunwin.com. Before we get to this week's show, I want to let folks know that they can get this podcast wherever you find your podcasts, including iHeartRadio, Spotify, Overcast, Stitcher, and of course, Apple Podcasts. Make sure you subscribe so you don't miss an episode. And subscribing means you get both this show, Talking Headways, and Mondays at the Overhead Wire, where this music I'm talking about comes from, on the same feed. Two fun podcasts, one great channel. Subscribe today. Nelda Ruiz and Rose Gray, welcome to the Talking Headways podcast. Thank you. Thank you for having us. So before we get started, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. I'm Nelda Ruiz. I'm the president and CEO of Asociación Puerto Riqueños en Marcha. That is APM. We're celebrating our 50th year here in Philadelphia. We're very multifaceted. With We're blessed that we're able to do a lot of social services. And once we get a family able to stabilize. We're able to then move them over to our community and economic development where we help them to become self-sufficient by owning their own home. And then I guess what we're gonna be talking today is about transportation, which is something that we've looked at very heavily in a way of stabilizing our community and also on greening. Cause well, there's a lot to say in that topic, but. <laughs> As we look at low-income families and uh, helping them to find jobs, we also realize that another way of building wealth is to decrease expenses and increase revenue, right? So with the greening and using the transportation is a way of lowering those expenses so that they can have more to save and for their quality of life. So how did Asociación Puerto Ricanos en Marcha get started 50 years ago? That's awesome. (laughs) Yeah, so Philadelphia has a huge history with Puerto Rico. We used to grow tobacco and and then the sugar refinery. So many of those ships and workers came from Puerto Rico. So there's a huge history of the Puerto Rican community here. So in in the 60s and 70s, we had some veterans that had come back from the uh, Vietnam War to Philadelphia and they looked at the community and they said, you know, this community needs help too. So they got together, ingratiated themselves to the mayor at that time, got a little grant and they started working with the community. And it was always about helping the community settle in Philadelphia, which is cold and very different than the island. And many of them came to either work in factories or in the sugar refinery, and their English wasn't too good looking. So the accent, it was a very misunderstood community. So we started with behavioral health to start helping the families assimilate. And also it was a good way to start teaching them and helping them to, well, I don't think we'll ever assimilate, but to be able to settle into the culture. In around 1989, We started with the first community and economic development by building housing that was affordable, that was decent and good standards. Most of the time, because they were low-income families, they would be in substandard homes. It was an area that was being disinvested because many of the industries were leaving to either go abroad or other places. So it was leaving the community without jobs. And many of these places were vacant, vacant lots. 
and it was where they could afford. So many of the housing, the windows would not be properly sealed. It was hard to keep heated during the winters. So they started working on that and we started our first project in 1989. That's awesome. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit. I want to let folks know that are listening to the podcast that this episode is part of our Health and Equitable TOD series. The first episode provides an overview with Dr. Georges Benjamin, who is executive director of the American Public Health Association. And the second episode looked at transit service under COVID in terms of community service with David Huffaker from the Port Authority of Allegheny County, which is the transit provider in Pittsburgh. And this episode is going to focus on leveraging TOD to create healthier communities, not only with access to healthcare, but also with other elements that make for a healthier zip code. So let's dive in. Let's talk about Paseo Verde. Where did that come about and what was the process like for building that development near transit? So I've been the CEO for the last 15 years. So I came in in 2005, but this was a concept that was conceived in 2003. And even though that I was in Washington, D.C., I did fund APM from D.C., And I heard Rose talking about how the younglings got her involved in the whole greening aspect. You know, first we thought, oh, they're a bunch of tree huggers. (laughs) And as we started (laughs) learning more and more, it just made sense. So it was conceived in 2003. I came in 2005. I thought it was just fabulous. But what was really interesting is that while we thought it was fabulous, it was so new to everyone, building green was is new. Then on top of that, we were talking about connecting it with transit-oriented development and what that meant. And it wasn't until 2009 that we actually got somebody to bite. It was the new uh, mayor that had just come in, Mayor Nutter, and he kept talking about how he wanted to make Philadelphia the greenest city in the country. So we took advantage of that and started talking to him and saying, all right, well, we've got the project for you. And even even with him, it became a little bit of a selling point. But once they got it and it started taking off, we were able to get the city to donate the property for a dollar. And we started working on it. And at that time, that, that's the other thing. Developers kept looking at it and running away from it. We were able to connect with Jonathan Rose from New York, who was an expert in greening and not scared of it. So we developed a relationship with him. It took 21 financing sources, a little bit from here, a little bit from there. City at the time, we had a board member that gave us the first $100,000. Don Haskins, who was a good friend, believed in us and gave us the first 100000 in planning. So we started working with that. And we finished it in 2013. Rose, you want to add more to that? The Jonathan Rose, the whole coming of this concept? I think it was just a shared response to what we felt would be a catalyst for change in the community. We do build through comprehensive planning and community vision. And our partner, Jonathan Rose, also believed in that. So we decided to do a charrette and bring the community into the process. And many of the green features that we looked at were based on the need to create a healthy environment, a walkable community, lower the carbon print within the community. And so with all the same philosophies, we were able to, as Nilda said, finding 21 subsidies to be able to build the project was a feat in itself because it is a mix of new market tax credit, low income housing tax credits, and private financing. The partnership is a 40 year equal partnership between APM and the Jonathan Rose companies. And Nilda can share the number of units, the importance of the social service programs and the federally qualified health center. So if you can imagine in 1970, This was a neighborhood that we have two highways that go around. So you can skip this neighborhood completely with never having to see it. It was a disinvested. It was, it had lots that people were just dumping on cars and and broken glass. It talked a lot into the turmoil that was, that was happening at the time. We start building and when we start building housing At that time, air conditioning was not an important thing. So when we started in 89, we took this factory and we converted it into affordable one and two bedroom units. So we start evolving. Then 
after we built like 213 affordable units, we started getting into home ownership. We started getting subsidies and getting people to buy them. At that time, there was a lot of disinvestment and people were leaving the city. So they didn't think it was going to grow the way that it's growing right now. So we were being a little bit more generous with our lots. So you'll find these beautiful homes that have a carport and they look like suburban homes. People love them. And we started building those at 55,000. I know for San Francisco, you're like, what? <laughs> <laughs> and then um, the last was up to 160,000. And today they're like worth 300,000, which I know for you, that won't even get you a studio in San Francisco, but <laughs> different parts of the country are different. But what was really different is that we built this beautiful neighborhood of home ownership. It had beautiful buildings, our facilities. We built a supermarket. Like Rose said, we always have built with community input. So one of the things that the community said, it, it would be so nice to be able to get like some of the produce that we like, like the breadfruits, the mangoes, the ground provisions that we're used to in Puerto Rico, right? So we were able to bring that supermarket. We were able to bring these things. But when we looked, there was this rail station, and here in Philadelphia, it's called SEPTA. There was a huge divide between our community and the West Side, and Temple University is there too with all the students, but it was only one block away. But when you looked at this side, it was, it, it's beautiful. The community started engaging with each other as they started mixing. They have garden clubs, and it looks really nice. Then you look down the street, and it's dark and dingy. There's this rail station that is, it's just dark and uninviting. And then you get to the other side where Temple is and it's all lit. It looks affluent. It looks nice. So, you know, connecting those two was a real issue. So, and that's how that, the whole concept of how do we develop that? And for me, I thought, wow, you know, owning a car today is like having a mortgage. So if we can get our people and Changing behavior is the hardest thing for people and getting them to take that mentality. And in fact, I remember when I first told my mom, she goes, oh, horrors, who wants to take public transportation? For her, she worked in a factory. So public transportation meant sweaty, stinky people with stinky armpits holding the, the thing. She goes, oh, who wants to be in that, right? But the more I thought if they were able to do that, they would be able to save money. And we're transportation rich. Philadelphia has a lot of bus lines. We've got trains. And then this particular train stop was a rail station out to the suburbs. And what we were noticing is the city was increasing on in population. A lot of Latinos were moving out into the suburbs. And most of the jobs being created, the growth area was in the suburbs. So this transportation connected our city, our residents, to where the jobs were. And it also connected those new Latinos families coming into Pennsylvania, into the suburbs, to APM, where we were a little bit more established with the social services. So it has created that dynamic. We also worked with SEPTA, and we got them to invest a million dollars into that station. And they worked with the Philadelphia Mural Arts. So we had beautiful murals, nicer lighting. They put nice kiosks to come in and out. So now when you look at Paseo Verde, first of all, it's, it's vibrant. It, it just has a pop of color that makes it look really interesting and nice. And it blends in with Temple's red colors. And then you have the city. So it, it kind of like, it just brought it all together. And now you see people, you know, bikers you know, from side to side and you see the, the connection. There's not that divide between the two communities. I think that is one of the biggest success stories that we've seen. Also, anecdotally, the people that have moved in have told us that they're going less to the hospitals because of asthma, because they have better ventilation. One of the things we do when they move in is we show them how to use products that are not Clorox, that are not toxic. So they learn, there's that whole education piece we recycle. So they get to also learn how to use products better that are better for the environment. Then we were able to get a, a federally qualified health center to lease downstairs and we have a pharmacy. So now the residents are able to come down and go to the health center. They have a pharmacy right there. Our headquarters are there. It's mixed income. So we have market rate 
and we have the low income tax credit. So we have people that have subsidies that pay as low as $66 a month. And then we have others that are paying uh, as much as 1400. Outside of the financial line, you would not know the difference between the two. The community side has a community room, which the market side can use as well. And then the market side has a gym, which the low income side can use as well. So outside of that, the finishes and everything are the same. And people say, oh, they, you know, you can't have mixed income. They don't, the two communities don't get along. We have not found any issues. I mean, they work well together. We haven't had any issues. And whatever we've heard has been positive. That's pretty awesome. One of the big things that I noticed from your project was that it was one of the first or the first to receive the LEED Platinum rating for neighborhood design, making it one of the greenest developments in the United States. How is it decided to have the project develop in a LEED Platinum certified? Because that's a lot of work. And for being one of the first ones, that was probably even more work, I imagine. Yeah. Well, you know, we, we didn't start with that as the goal. We just, you know, wanted to do it. It was a, a nice outcome to that. So to become LEED certified, I mean, you have to have the green elements. So they look, some of the things they look at is, is it a smart location and does it have the linkages? So is it conserving water? So we have the green roofs, we have a blue roof, which isn't blue, but <laughs> <laughs> like a big pool and it holds water. So one of the things, the city is a very old city. So to fix the infrastructure it's in the billion. So what, what the water department is doing is they're giving people credit to be able to develop in more um, pervious uh, surfaces. So this lets the water down slowly so it doesn't rush into the sewage system. So those are some of the things that it looks at. They look at housing and the proximity to the jobs. So this connects the two. It looks at you know the elimination of brownfields. So the other thing is they look at neighborhood patterns and designs like is it walkable what's the impact of that development does it connect to an open community does it have a street network so we work with the city and with the department of health so our staff works on a walkability route with the department of health so we have that connection to it so those were some of the elements and then there's the green infrastructure of the actual building. So the materials are supposed to keep it warm, and it does in the winter, and it keeps it cool in the summer. So it, you use less energy to keep it cool or heat it. It's a certified green building. So they look at the construction and all that. And then they look at the innovation in the design. And I mean, it took a village. I, I don't think any one of us could have come up with all of these elements. But between the community, between Rose and her expertise of all these years that she has developing, Jonathan Rose and his greening mentality and the things that he has done, we were able to bring all these things together that got us to be the first one in the country and only second in the world, the first one being in China. And we did get a Chinese delegation that came and they invited us to go see, we're waiting for this COVID stuff to be done, <laughs> to be able to go and see it. We just, and we're constantly having students go through, but Rose, maybe you can talk more about the technical elements of it. Yeah, Nilda, thank you. I think you really hit everything as far as giving the outline a wide lead indeed. There was an intentional in the beginning. We went to Green Build, we went to see other projects across the nation, um, and it, it was like, this is it. And, and Nilda often says, we're sometimes saddened by uh, developers that don't, t don't have the same philosophy uh, when they're building affordable housing. And Nilda says, if they can do it here, they could do it anywhere, especially when we're reaching the lowest income persons, as well as those that are market rate as well. And then providing services that benefit everybody, whether you're low income or market. So I think it's a challenge we thought there would be more projects like this throughout the country, but it seems like the green thing has kind of waned a little in some areas, but we always strive. We have Sheridan Street is 13 units of, of wonderful housing that is gold lead as well. And we're building a senior housing that'll be passive green. 
So APM has continued with this philosophy and when we're doing preservation in our community, we also are using techniques, lowering the HERS, et cetera, to make more energy efficient. As Nilda said, our first set of houses had no air conditioning. <laughs> we just preserved 80 units. They were the happiest tenants in the world because though one can say, well, you know, you're using energy by air conditioning, but today everyone's entitled to air conditioning during the summer. And I think besides China, we had Nigeria, we had Australia, we had people from all over the world as well as within the U.S. come and visit and they take little bits and pieces from what APM has done and everyone is very excited. So this project cost $48 million. We had $12 million in grants and the rest was financed through a new market tax credit. So the financing was really complicated, but in that $48 million to do all those green elements that we mentioned, it only cost $250,000 in the whole project. So that's like really minimal compared to $48 million. So that's why I said if we could do it, anybody else can do it. And it's surprising, like some of these elements, is not like it's a big ordeal. Like for example, we have, if you look at our building, it has these shade things that, were, uh, that go up and down. And, and I thought it was for aesthetics. And here I found out there's pipes that are going through there. They have more of a function, but also they serve as a block for the sun. And um, there are things that are worked in there. The blue roof and then the green roof, it's not like it was that much, but all of those. And then the little ventilations in the different apartments that make the air quality better. It's not a whole lot to do. And it's just so, so much better for us for breathing and living healthier, that I don't understand why people don't do it. And that's why we, you know, it costs a little bit more, but it's so worth it for the health of the community. Well, it's so interesting now, you know, Philadelphia seems to be a leader, especially for stormwater retention now with their programs for, you know, making sure that a lot of the water goes back into the ground instead of on impervious cover. I'm wondering if your building and some of the work that you all did helped inform that. I mean, you mentioned the mayor being interested in your project and all that stuff. I'm wondering if that connected to that program. Okay, Rose, we're at all of those. <laughs> yeah, we were one of the first that did the major stormwater. And what was is not new. I mean, when you look at a blue roof, most of our roofs years ago were blue roofs. They retained the water <laughs> and they helped cool our homes. And we don't think of it. I mean, when they tried to explain it to Nilda and I, the architect, we were a little hesitant but when the water department came in and said, whoa, that's great. And all it is is a little filter, as she said, in the way the, the water you know, penetrates the filter and goes down in, into and then outside. Now, we do have a detention basin, but still, again, everything was designed to slow everything down to go into the sewer system. All of our projects, it's very different. When we first built, everything had to go underground. And... We saw in our community, a lot of the basements had the water from the pressure, the hydrostatic pressure coming up. Now we don't have that. Now it flows on the ground. It goes softly in. So we've learned so much. And Philadelphia, you're right, is on the cutting edge of uh, showing the rest of the nation how to do good storm water in urban environments. So yeah, we were one of the first to embrace their concepts. And we still work with them on vacant land the crate parks and all, we also use that as another method of water coming off of buildings. An important part of you guys' work is public health. You mentioned some of the programs, but I'm wondering what, what are some of the services you all provide for the community overall? So we have behavioral health, children protective services. We also do early childhood education, pre-K and Head Start. Around the health, we work with the Department of Health and it's more around the community engagement. So doing the walkability, we do intergenerational activities where the gardening, teaching people how to do community gardens so they can do their own fresh foods. We had, and we're starting it up again, we had this wonderful food buying club with volunteers. And what I loved about it is that anybody in the community could come, we would get whatever excess produce the farmers would have, we would bring it and people could buy it. And you didn't have to show a card. You didn't have to show that you're low income. So everybody would come and they would pre-order it. And we got to how much, like, I know it was tons, the truckloads that we got of food on the food buying club, but it, it got so large 
that it was difficult to run it with just volunteers. So we just had a study done and they showed us how we could at least break even so that we could hire someone because it takes a lot of coordination. So we're in the process of starting that again with healthy foods. And the, you know, just community development with all those social determinants of health, you know, because I always mention that our theory of change is that people thrive in a healthy environment. So if you have a child in a healthy home, they're going to thrive in a healthy home and a healthy neighborhood will thrive. And if the neighborhood is healthy, the city will thrive, right? So the concentric circles of the health environment. We have a strong organizing component. I mean, we're now COVID compliant, but we still go door to door. We have a housing counseling program. We're working with renters right now and eviction. The moratorium is the end of it is coming upon us. The homeless may look a lot different. I mean, I've been to San Francisco many times and it's very sad. And I think we'll see more of that across the nation. So we address that. We have a financial opportunity center that looks at everybody, what benefits, can you get SNAP? Can you get childcare benefits? So we look at the whole person and then we have four NACI, four star daycare center and Head Start programs can put their children through uh, an educational process. So uh, we're multifaceted, the largest employer of minorities in the city of Philadelphia. 90% of our staff, over 400 I think, Hilda. Yeah. We're culturally competent in the services we provide, and we think that's really important. So we, we've done the food buying, the walkability, and then we've worked with making more outdoor spaces where people can congregate in a healthy way. But like Rose said, with the COVID, we've been communicating with people with their cell phones, a lot of Zoom meetings. It was really difficult at the beginning because not everybody has Wi-Fi, and today we realize that internet connection is not a luxury anymore. It's a way to be to get connected. So the school district here gave a lot of tablets out so that the education is at home. And then we realized that we still had like 20,000 kids in our neighborhood that did not have any Wi-Fi. So we've been working. Um, most of them, we've already gotten them either a hotspot or connecting them with the Comcast Internet Essentials. I don't know if you have that out there, but I think we do, yeah. Yeah, it's like $10 and they can get, you know, high-speed internet. And the city's been working with folks too, so we've gotten a lot better, but we still, there's still a digital divide. We still have some, especially among the seniors that are like scared of technology. And Yeah, and that's something that I read too, is that you all, you know, used to give out tokens for the subway and for buses and Philadelphia was famous for its token. I think I kept a couple when I was, last time I was there. But now it's a, it's a digital format, and so that affects how you all do your work as well, I imagine. So they changed to these fare cards, and there's all these challenges. First of all, the fares are still too high for our community. So in hindsight, we should, probably should have worked with the state or more to get subsidies for our low income. And we're still working on that, but we're not there. The other thing is that if they get one card... Every individual has to have one. So you can't get a mom with some kids with the same card, each one. So that that brings another dynamic to the whole fair. So it's been a challenge for us. And then when people would come to the office, we would give them a token to either get back or to get to our office. Then there's these transfers that are not anymore. I don't know, Rose, you're, you seem to be a little bit more in tune with this. The transfers were free. Now you pay a dollar, two dollars or whatever, and I haven't kept up with the cost during COVID, but it's really not user friendly. We have the FOC, we give out tokens. So if you were going a job, we could give you a few tokens. Now, you know, we have to go find out to get a pass. It's, it's labor intensive. It's not cost effective. People lose it. Can't convince anybody to go back to the tokens, but we are advocating, Nilda can talk, she was on APM Employees Plus Nilda War in Vision Zero. We are involved in a transit equity coalition and transfer Philadelphia Forward. And these are new things that are we're embarking on and trying to make that impression. It was important that Nilda brought everybody into focus with zero vision because they were talking about a center city areas, bicycle paths, all this, instead of, you know, <laughs> The issues in our community, people driving up this street, killing three kids on their way, you know. Um, so 
Yeah, it's really important that we're at these tables and I would tell other nonprofits because sometimes, you know, we talk a lot about the inequality and racism and, and sometimes I don't think it's so much racism. People know what they see, right? So the folks downtown, you know, that their lifestyle is very different. So they're looking at bike trails. Their conversations are very different than what our community is experiencing. They don't ride bikes. They walk wherever they go. So it's, um, it was a little bit different, but we've been able to bring in the conversation to be, make it more pedestrian friendly. And now, you know, it's starting to move up. The bike trails are starting to move up into our community. I'm seeing more and more people using bikes. And now we have the shared bikes in our community, like every quarter mile. You know, it's an education and it takes time and it's just different. But we're getting there. <laughs> You mentioned community outreach, and one of the things that I was interested in is something that's happening in Atlanta, too, and I think it's happening where you are, is that there's a community just outside of downtown where people who have owned their houses for a really long time are getting kind of preyed upon in terms of, you know, people try to buy their houses for cheap. The folks that are living there, they don't know the actual value of their house. The person might come and say, hey, I can give you $100,000 straight away, and their house, like you said, is actually worth $300,000, but they don't know that because they're not plugged into Zillow or whatever else. And I'm wondering how the community outreach is working for you all in, in that realm in terms of helping people realize what the value of their property is or the value of where they live. That has been a huge challenge for us. We're in an area, I kid around that we don't have a Starbucks yet, but I think we actually do down by the by Temple. <laughs> but <laughs> it is getting gentrified quickly. And Every piece of land that we look at, a developer has been approaching the city and you'll go by one week and next week something's going up. And yeah, they go around and they say, oh, well, we'll give you 40,000. And for them, that's a lot of money. They probably bought it for five or $10,000. We've lost a few homes to that, but I think the community now is wising up because we've been, the community connectors have actually been out there educating the community. So now they're like, oh no, I'm not letting go of my house. I understand it's worth something. And we've been, you know, letting them know this is your future. At some point you're gonna retire. You're gonna this will be what's gonna take you through that. So we try to get them to connect the value of their home and where we are right now. So the staff has been very creative during this pandemic time because while people are home, the developers are great time to do construction, not a whole lot of people. So they've been doing these caravans like a parade. Our neighborhood is not for sale. Don't sell your house. People come out and then they give them flyers. They educate them on what their homes are worth. So, you know, people are realizing the value. The sad thing is that at some point, you know, the people that are there that have taken a stake in this community for a really long time, how do we keep it affordable for them? New money is coming in and they just can't afford, you know, those resources. So we're trying to see how we can continue. But I think what we end up doing is slowing it down and maybe getting the newcomers with the old ones to start working together. But, you know, at some point, um, I don't know how long you can hold that back. And, um, you know, studies have shown that if you're more than seven miles from your job, it becomes really difficult and people are just getting pushed further and further into the Northeast and out into the suburbs. So we work with the community legal services and there's a bill and this just came out today, bill 200455, an anti-displacement bill for predatory home buyers. So we just got notice of that actually today. So it's very timely because uh, we have to encourage the residents not to sell. You know, when you're looking at somebody, and this happened, remember with Pasia Verde? Around the corner from Pasia Verde, when the first word came out that it was going to be built, a speculator, and I won't say his name, but came around on a Saturday handing out $50,000 cash to five homeowners in a row who took it and signed a quick deed. We like blinked an eye. It, it breaks my heart to this day. Now, the good news is because of Posse of Verde, the public housing around us was taken down, is being rebuilt to replace public housing, beautiful public housing, and it's all around. So they, that guy didn't stop. He wasn't able to stop affordable housing, but he did take advantage of those residents. And 
that is so sad. And wealth building, now do you want to talk just briefly about wealth building, about Pradera, how the residents split the homes for 50,000 and the reason we're encouraging them to stay. <laughs> Following that developer across the street where we did Paseo Verde, there were a lot of uh, vacant homes and shame on us because number one rule of developing is that you have to own the property. And many times we would go to the city, we have them hold it for us because there's a holding cost. You have to pay insurance. You have to have the upkeep. If anybody gets hurt on there, you have to keep insurance. And we're not, you know, we're nonprofit, so we don't have any extra excess revenue. So we try to hold off on that. And on these, we were thinking of maybe doing market rate home ownership, and we had this whole linear park that was going to go through the whole neighborhood, and this developer came by and just picked them all up. And I mean, our project has been transformative. We see the, the change in the community, but that was a missed opportunity for our neighborhood. But in wealth building, you know, we have families that we've taken from homelessness to home ownership. We've been around 50 years, so we have enough time to see the transformation in a family. We have several stories, but she's allowed us to tell her story. We used to have a shelter. She came to our shelter with her children, running away from an abusive husband. And um, she used to help around, and we gave her a little part-time job. Then she went and she got a full-time job, and the social services working with her mentally, the whole behavioral health on how to deal with this abuse and how not to take it, what to do with her children. So we helped her out mentally that way. She rented one of our, our first apartments and she says, you know, I want to own one of those houses. So she started going to the housing counseling and started saving up as we started building. And she was working and saving, working and saving. And she bought her first house for $55,000. And she moved in there with her three girls. Today, she's working full-time for the council president. Her daughter is now a homeowner. The other one is in college. And so that whole cycle has just been broken. And now she's got a family that are also homeowners that are going to college. And we have several like that. So it's not just the bricks and mortar and what you see, but, but the impact that you make on these families and the wealth building that comes from that. Now you have a generation that will pass assets to the next generation and so on. The 150 homes, I'll just say with the, we sold them for 55, created a market to 90, then created a market to 160. That was a sweet spot. That was ended, we stopped developing home ownership in 2010. The houses today are worth 300,000. Now, they had to keep it affordable for 15 years. Only two out of 150 have sold. We have helped create a generation of people that will be able to send their children to college. And so we're very joyous in that as we manage economic change in the community so that there is no displacement. So we, we're trying now to do another 100 in some homes and we'll do some market that will help subsidize down to 80% the other home. So we're trying to, today that mixed income theory, we're gonna to try to do that because we think home ownership is as important as rental. We need both. We need people to have their own wealth building ability through home ownership and renters to be able to let another renter come in. And I know it may be different in San Francisco, but Philly's a real, I wanna own a home. <laughs> Well, we do too. It's just like whether you have a million, two million dollars or not, uh, that's the problem, uh, which is insane. But that's a whole other discussion, yeah, <laughs> obviously. Yeah. But I mean, that's kind of connected to another thought I have is that, you know, you all are doing such a great job in building wealth for people, in building homes for people. How does, you know, the change of the center city and how it's reaching you all affect that and your ability to do that? Because as the property values increase, as the interest increases, it must be harder to build homes that are, you know, you started out at 55,000, that's pretty inexpensive, but it must be going up and up, like you mentioned. So the conundrum that we have is that, so there's a, a restriction on these homes. When they purchase it, they have to keep them 15 to 20 years affordable, right? But for some of them, they, it's past that. And so now if they decide to sell, and it's okay, I mean, that's the American dream, right? They have all these assets, but you know, then we lose an affordable home for an affordable family. So we are thinking through this right now, like 
you know, I'm really split on it. Some people are talking about having a land trust in that way, you know, you have an area that you're able to keep affordable for future generations. I mean, that's, that's one way of doing it. The other side of it is, you know, they've stayed there 20 years and they've worked and they've gotten a better future. So, you know, I was born in Philly, in North Philly, and I got to go to college through Pell Grants. So, you know, and here I am in this position and I've been able to invest and, you know, accumulate, it's funny to say wealth because there's no way that that's even considered wealth, but I've been able to have some savings, right? That I can live comfortable, right? Well, no one is telling me to give back my Pell Grant or to pay it. It's in my brain. I've been, I've been able to do something with my degree. And in the same way, you know, we're, we're helping these families and future generations. So, you know, there's a philosophy, well, you didn't pay market rate for it, so you should not have rights to that and you should give something back. But then again, they've had to keep it affordable for 15, 20 years. So it, it, it's, I don't know, it's a vicious circle and one that we're working through to see. And, you know, the land trust is becoming more appealing just to be able to keep, you know, some homes affordable and, and keep the community. But, you know, we've, Rose and I have talked about this a lot that you really can't engineer a neighborhood or force people to be together. When we first started out, 90% was Puerto Rican. So most of the housing and everything we did was Puerto Rican. And today the, the neighborhood is half Puerto Rican, half African-American. Everybody told us, you know, that's not going to work. Latinos and African-Americans just do not mix. And, you know, we don't have the issues that other communities, they, I think when people get to know each other and they realize we're all people just like everyone else, and they work very well together. In fact, we have a neighborhood advisory council and the president was Latino and the vice president was African-American. He didn't speak a word of English and the African-American didn't speak a word of Spanish. I don't know how they understood each other, but they're like really good friends. They go everywhere together. And I'm like, does he understand what you just said? Ah, he knows, he knows that I'm calling him. And then the other one says, oh yeah, I understand what he's trying to tell me. It, it is they get along. And if you drive by, and I invite you that if you're ever in Philly, come by and visit, the neighborhood has curb appeal. It's, it's a nice neighborhood and people get along. The families, they watch out for each other. And, you know, the crime rate has reduced a lot. In our neighborhood, we get some thefts or whatever, but we don't have the violent crimes that we see in other areas of the city because they all watch out for each other. Yeah, I think I think that the push from Center City has come. It's like Field of Dreams. If you build, they will come. But we really didn't want to build a new come. No, it's <laughs> <laughs> it's like if you would help, if we could have continued to manage change. We believe in mixed income, as you can see, but we also know that you have to make sure people aren't displaced, etc. So we had no opportunity. They just came, bought up properties. People sold, city gave them properties, though the city's been good to us, so I'm not criticizing. But what's interesting is they want to come into areas that we've stabilized and we're trying to maintain cultural identity, et cetera, whereas our state encourages organizations like us to build in more wealthier communities to help create a mixed income, but they're not welcome. That's the NIMBY. So we're not allowed to be NIMBY they can come in, but they can be NIMBY and say, don't come in. And so that's, it's very disheartening. But that's why when Nilda and we were talking about anti-displacement, do not leave, keep your assets, you know, et cetera. That's our job right now. And try to partner with some of these groups to say, hey, our councilwoman's trying to create 20% has to be affordable if you're going to do these major projects all kinds of things, legislation. And we can only stand behind her and others and say, you know, our city's innovative. Let me say Philadelphia and the state are very innovative. They're trying to pass a 400, in COVID, a $400 million bond bill to pour more money into affordability, housing counseling, small business, et cetera. So I think we're blessed in Philly and the state and we just have to, you know, keep plugging along. You all have the health center, the pharmacy, multiple different community services, childcare, et cetera. 
I'm wondering if you've seen a difference in in the health outcomes of residents that live in in the property or in the neighborhood overall. I mean, you just mentioned how everybody seems to get along and it's a, a wonderful community, but I'm wondering if you've actually seen any you know markers that show that this is is getting healthier. I think that what I had mentioned earlier that we we've had you know anecdotally that that some of the community have told us that they've been going to the doctors less because of their asthma. Also in the way they maintain their homes, you know, it's clean, it's walkable. I think that shows a lot too. Right, well, I think you mentioned earlier, so besides walkability and uh, weatherization of houses, we helped preserve over a hundred homeowner houses of low income persons through a grant program that gave $40,000 to put new windows, doors, roof, et cetera. The food, the food buying club, teaching people. We do outreach when it's not COVID to show people what portion controls are, what fruit and vegetables. So we try to healthy eating along with your walking and people want to come. We had 400 subscribers to our volunteer food buying club, 400 within a small community. The city also tracks like the recycling and re so they have these maps and red is absolute, you know, nobody recycles. And then they start getting, you know, lighter red, yellow, and it goes up to green where everybody recycles and the bins have like a little barcode. So our neighborhood has moved from the red, red to that light yellow side. So people are recycling more. So we see that change in behavior in people in the in the community. So those are little indicators that we see more and more. But um, do we have a study that actually shows outcomes? No. The Pew Foundation did, um, they did a report on poverty in Philadelphia and they came and talked to our community and they said, you know, you guys have been here 40 years combating this whole poverty. And here we are 40 years later and you're still a low income community. And we thought about it for a minute And it made me think, you know, I grew up in this neighborhood, right, where, you know, it was socially and economically disadvantaged. I went to college and I moved out. And most of the families that I grew up with don't live there anymore. So they come in because it's affordable. And then we end up moving out when, you know, the means can afford you something better. So even though that they think it's still like a a low income area, it's not the same community that was there 30, 40 years ago. The other thing I would say about that, the community that they mentioned is that many of them are working class people, but they're working in factories or the services, and they probably make as much as somebody who's a public assistant, you know, which is, that's a whole other dynamic. You know, uh, you work in these really low paying jobs and it's like, why when you work so hard and, you know, you can't afford the medical you can't afford a lot of the services that you get for free if you're on public assistance. But many of these families are working, you know, low income working families. I feel like I could talk to you all day about this. It's so interesting, but I have one last question for you. Do you have any advice for community developers around the country that might be trying to do similar things as you all are doing green building, community centers, health impact stuff? I'm curious if there's any words of wisdom for other folks that might be trying to do the same wonderful things you all are doing. Political will, Nolde, right? I think we always said that if you can't get the political will, it'll never happen. So it's influencing, right? Yeah. So like we started at the beginning, right, that we conceived this in 2003. We didn't get any bites until 2009. We finished it in 2013. And now we're in 2020 and people are still talking about it. And you don't have more, like we would have thought that more of these projects would be happening and they're not. And And part of it is the political will, the understanding. We're in a different climate, you know, administratively, where, you know, the green building is not at the forefront. So it's a different philosophy. But I just think we have to keep preaching it and and showing examples of what has been done and try to do more of it. I mean, we're trying to get to lower emissions with the cars and we should be doing the same with the buildings and keep pressing on this because it's for the health of the community and for the longevity of it. You know, it it takes political will. 
I'm not sure how I could accelerate that more. I remember, even though that was under Mayor Nutter, he asked me to be co-chair of his transition team. And I was very afraid because I said, you know, I've never been on anything political and I was afraid that I would harm him. But even though that I had that close relationship with him where I had his cell number and I could call him, it took a long time to get him to buy into it. And once he did and he understood it, you know, all gates opened and water flew, but but there are others that are coming after him that are not getting it. This current mayor wrote a whole white paper about how our project is the best example of public and private development money coming together. And academically, I guess he gets it, but there's not more of it happening. You know, so they used to have, the politicians had this walk around money that they used to call where they could decide and you know, people may see it bad, but in our case, it was a good thing because Senator Casey was able to give us $400,000. The governor gave us $4 million, Governor Randell, before he left. And then in that transition of him and Ridge, we had $2 million that came from the one before. So between them, that was discretionary money that they could put to the project. So we got almost $7 million from that discretionary money to put into this project. So that's why, you know, I think about it and I don't know how a project like ours could happen again without having the political will and the discretionary funds to be able to do something like that. So, you know, I don't know how we would do it now. And the, and the project has paid for itself. We've been 100% rented from day one. We thought the first three years, our debt coverage ratio, we would have a little bit of a deficit until the third year. Year one, we have had no deficits. In fact, we were thinking of upping the rents, but then we have an 80% area medium income that we have to keep. So we can't do that or else we would you know, price it out for them. But um, it's a good project and it's been very low maintenance. It's made money. It didn't cost that much more than a regular building. It's only $250,000 more in a $48 million project. So I don't know why there's not more of it done, but I would say if people have the idea, just keep pressing on it. And it's not that much more to build green than a regular development. I think it's also storytelling, telling your story, being able to tell your story. I think APM's rich history, integrity, getting your projects done on time, on budget, and then having the confidence of a city that was innovative to know that when they had acres of vacant land, they gave it to nonprofits. Nonprofits rebuilt and stabilized most of the communities in Philadelphia that the for-profits are now benefiting from. That story is not told. Nonprofits lead the way. And then I think there's sadly the recognition, like I spoke at a conference once and I was shouted down, rightfully so. An organization that worked on Tobacco Road, they don't even have sewer, no infrastructure. And they're listening to me talk about Pradera and building these houses and getting ready to build. And they said, lady, we still have outhouses. You're here talking about this. So it was the wrong audience. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I went on and I realized, and as I've been fortunate and Nilda has, we go across the country, there are areas that will not be ready for any of this for a long time. So we have to look at who we're speaking with. What did we learn doing something maybe differently that we could help them with? But again, as Nilda said, political will, policy, and somebody out there with deep pockets or at least land. Well, I want to thank you all for coming on the show, Rose and Nilda. We really appreciate your time and what you've been able to do. Well, thank you, Jeffrey, and thank you for having us. Thank you. Take care. And thanks for joining us. The Talking Headways podcast is a project of The Overhead Wire on the web at theoverheadwire.com. Sign up for a free trial of The Overhead Wire Daily, our 14-year-old Daily Cities news list, by clicking the link at the top right of theoverheadwire.com. And please, please, please support the pod. You can go to patreon.com slash the overhead wire. Many thanks to our current patrons for their ongoing support. And as always, you can subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Overclass, Spotify, and wherever you get your podcasts. And you can always find a traditional home at usa.streetsblog.org. See you next time at Talking Headways.